Correctional facility, and there to teach what we call the spiritual formation class. Uh, basically, a fancy way to talk about our relationship with God and the inmates. Uh, and we was on in uh, going into 271, and went into the control booth. And the folks in the control booth there had a basic question for me, and they asked, "What do you want? Blacks or Hispanics?" Um, excuse me. This is 21st century, isn't it? No, what do you want? Blacks or Hispanics? The whole jail was on a segregation, uh, and they were on segregation for many months uh, between blacks and Hispanics. So the only thing that you could do was you could have a class for all blacks, or you could have a class for all Hispanics. And that was when I knew, if I didn't know before, that this was a rather different world. Uh, and we're going to be going into this different world to talk about problems in the jail, uh, and uh, the challenges of its reform. This is a world that most people don't really understand very well, and for my limited time working in it, it's actually a world where many people working in it don't necessarily understand it very well, whether their inmates are actually the staff there, because there's so much going on. It's such a complex, bureaucratic place uh, where the work is challenging, it's important, potentially very dangerous, um, and the temptations to abuse of power are always going to be there, always going to be significant. And where public resources, both in terms of money and other kinds of support, tends to be pretty fickle. We know that we've got lots of problems with the LA County jail system. You can't read the paper, watch the news on television without knowing that. Uh, and especially at Men's Central Jail downtown, one of the two men's jails in downtown, uh, where overcrowding has been an issue and the subject of federal lawsuits since 1975. And one of the questions we're going to be talking about with the panelists here is exactly what is new and exactly what isn't new uh, about our current situation. We certainly got some new prospects for change. Uh, we have two new reports, uh, the Vera report, which you have excerpted in your materials, and the James Austin report, which came out uh, very recently um, by ACL, uh, ACLU and adopted also by the Sheriff's Department. Uh, one of the things that I think is important for us to consider in this area, as in other areas in criminal justice, is what it might mean to succeed. What are the criteria that we might set for success in getting a handle on problems in the jail? That's something we don't often do in criminal justice because we're so preoccupied with the current crisis, uh, the current controversy. We're just trying to resolve that. Well, I would put four things out for consideration as criteria for success here. One is to make jailing constitutional. That is to consistent with the Eighth Amendment, uh, to curb violence against inmates and also between inmates and violence against correctional officers, to make two jailing efficient, uh, to use this important resource as it is really needed to be used and no more than that. Number three, to make jail sentences the subject of judicial decision as opposed to law enforcement decision. That is, that the sentences set in court actually be the sentences that are meaningful, 
might be modified uh, a little bit in terms of uh, the, the sequence of incarceration, but not to have them determined by population decisions on the part of the sheriff's department, as has been true here for many years. And finally, to make the basic programming in the jail state of the art uh, and tie that to state of the art uh, reentry programs. We can all talk about whether those things make sense to anybody else. Format for our basic uh, procedure here is that I'm going to be asking questions of each of the panelists. We'll sort of go with a couple of rounds of that, then open things up for the panelists to ask each other anything they want and also to open it up to the audience here. Uh, now to introduce our panelists. Uh, we don't have up here everybody who counts in LA County jail reform, but we've got a pretty good selection <laughs> of them, uh, especially of the folks who count on the lawyer side of things. Uh, each of our panelists has had a very distinguished legal career, which is reflected in the responsibilities that they have with respect to jail issues. So I'm going to introduce each of them individually, but fairly briefly, and focusing primarily on the matters at hand, because to give a more complete biography would simply take more time from the discussion that we're all here to have. Uh, in alphabetical order, the Honorable Lourdes Baird uh, is chair of the recently formed Citizens Commission on Jail Violence, which has been charged by the LA County Board of Supervisors to look into abuses at the county jail facilities. Uh, in her extraordinary legal career, Judge Baird has served as a federal prosecutor locally, she, as a municipal court judge, a Los Angeles County Superior Court judge. She has served on the district court bench from, uh, uh, and she served as the United States Attorney uh, in 19, uh, 1990 to 92 and on the district court bench 92 <clears throat> to 2005. Now retired from the bench, she serves as an arbitrator and mediator for JAMS and Arbitration and Mediation Service. Merrick Bob is the LA County Board of Supervisors go-to guy for legal oversight of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and has served in that role for some 20 years. He is special counsel of the Police Assessment Resource Center and his resume reads a little bit like the history of law enforcement oversight here in Los Angeles over the last generation. 1991, Deputy General Counsel of the Christopher Commission, overseeing Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, 1992, General Counsel of the Colts investigation of the LA County Sheriff's Department, and was thereafter appointed to monitor the Sheriff's Department for the Board of Supervisors. 1995, he served as Special Counsel to the LA uh, Police Commission, helping to establish the Inspector General's office there. He serves as a policing expert to the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, and the organization that he founded, the Police Assessment Resource Center, is the only national nonprofit focused exclusively on police oversight and accountability. It has conducted investigations and, and analyzed law enforcement operations around the country, cities from Los Angeles to Portland to Milwaukee and New Orleans. Peter Eliasberg is legal director and Mannheim family attorney for First Amendment rights of the ACLU of Southern California. He's been extremely busy with jail issues, as you may have seen in the paper, uh, and especially with the issuance of the so-called Austin Report, in which both the ACLU and the Sheriff's Department have joined, which recommends the closing of Men's Central Jail downtown. Uh, Mr. Weisberg is also lead counsel on Rosas versus Baca. I'm sure he'll be telling us about that, a constitutional lawsuit alleging numerous abuses, abuses against inmates in the county jails. Michael Janaka is chief attorney of the Office of Independent Review, which is the group of six private attorneys who under contract from the LA County Board of Supervisors ensures that allegations of misconduct by sheriff's department members are investigated and reviewed in a fair, thorough, and impartial manner. His office provides oversight of the sheriff's department internal investigations and provides recommendations to the sheriff on disciplinary matters. He has been appointed by a federal judge as expert consultant to help design a similar office for the state prison system. 
uh, and has assisted many law enforcement agencies, including San Diego County Sheriff's Department, Burbank Police Department, Oakland Police Department, and many others. Lawrence Middleton is the chief of the United States Attorney's Office Public Corruption and Civil Rights Section for the Central District of California. Joined the U.S. Attorney's Office in 1990 and has been Deputy Chief of Training, Deputy Chief of the Public Corruption and Government Fraud Section. He was one of four prosecutors assigned to the federal uh, Rodney King Civil Rights Trial and served a one-year detail with the Department of Justice's National Church Arson Task Force. In his current position, Mr. Middleton oversees federal investigations into a wide variety of civil rights violations, including those that involve law enforcement and including those that might occur in the county jails. So, with that as introduction, let's begin. Mr. Weisberg, uh, I want if, to ask you a simple question. What's the problem? I wish I could give you a simple answer. Um, so let me set a couple things aside. There are so many problems in the LA County Jail that you, the ACLU, if it had the resources, could probably bring 15 different lawsuits challenging constitutionality of various behaviors. It runs from the treatment of the mentally ill to a variety of other things. But right now, we have chosen to identify what we believe is the absolute worst problem and focus on that. But I don't want to suggest, when I tell you what the worst problem is, that there are not thousands of other, well, I should say about 10 others or 15 others that could form the basis for major constitutional lawsuits. The LA County Jail, in terms of the level of violence, the amount of deputy on inmate abuse, and the excessive nature of the force used is the worst jail or prison in the United States, bar none. Now, that's a strong statement, and you may say, well, it comes from an ACLU lawyer, what's your basis for that? And I'll tell you what my basis for that. Many different things. Tom Parker, who used to be second in command of the FBI's Los Angeles field office, who ran major pattern and practice investigations of law enforcement agencies, including jails and prisons around the country, reviewed materials, substantial materials about the jails, and he concluded after that review that he had never seen anything remotely resembling the level and brutality that he saw in the LA County jails. Tony Baer, a professional corrections expert for probably 35 years, assistant warden in New York, someone who's been warden for uh, a number of prisons around the country, including uh, you know, high-level security facilities in Virginia and other states, similarly said, I've never seen anything like it in terms of the brazenness, volume, and brutality exhibited. I've sent an email out, a colleague of mine sent an email out, and I've seen some of it from a prison listserv, basically asking, have any of you ever been aware of a situation where civilian eyewitnesses have come forward to report grossly excessive force that they've seen in the jails? And the answer was, with almost an exception, no. They've never seen anything like that. But in the LA County jails in the last year, we brought forth five civilian eyewitnesses, two chaplains, a jail tutor, an ACLU monitor, to, to report that they have seen brutal unjustified beatings of people who are lying motionless, oftentimes handcuffed and not resisting, as deputies wailed on them, oftentimes in large numbers, using flashlights, kicking them, punching them, yelling, stop resisting, stop resisting, while they were not moving, and in some cases appeared to be so badly hurt, blood pouring out of their heads and other things. This is unheard of in any jail facility in the country because what is necessary for a civilian eyewitness to see this? The deputies have to feel such a level of impunity that they believe that they can get away with it. And they do, and they have in the LA County Jail for years. So we have chaplains who come forward and tell us this, we have jail tutors, we have the ACLU's own monitor who saw this, and what we get from the Sheriff's Department is two things. The ACLU exaggerates or inmates lie, and we also hear that, well, there are a few problems, but it's really not that serious, and jails have bad guys in them, so we have to expect this kind of violence. But the last point I'm going to make in support of this is my colleague, Margaret Winner, who's been the associate director of the ACLU's National Prison Project for almost 20 years, has litigated cases in Maricopa County, the famous Sheriff Joe Arpaio. She's been in Mississippi Supermax facilities. She's been in, in prisons in Alabama. She has seen the worst of the worst. 
And she's also made decisions not to bring pattern and practice cases. And she has categorically stated that she has never seen anything like what exists in the Los Angeles County jails in terms of the level of brutality and the violence. And the, the kind of violence is reflected on the fact that the kind of injuries we see over and over again, and not just inmates reporting this, but civilian eyewitnesses reporting it, injuries that we observe, brutal head injuries. Well, any corrections expert who's any good will tell you that when you want to restrain a recalcitrant inmate, you go for the limbs and you handcuff. But we have over and over again observed inmates in either photographs or our own observations when we meet with them. Teeth kicked in, broken cheekbones, broken jaws, major head wounds that come from having their heads slammed against concrete walls, people with 35 and more stitches. There is never a justification in trying to restrain an inmate to kick his teeth in, but I have seen more than one inmate with teeth kicked in. The level of violence in the Emmett County jails is the shame of Los Angeles, and it is worse than anywhere in the country. That's the problem that we're focused on right now, but there are many, many others. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Michael Janaka. Uh, you have, as part of your responsibilities, to look at a lot of the, uh, the internal uh, investigations uh, of brutality. Uh, so perhaps you could explain first a little bit about what your office does, which is fairly unique, uh, and also to say something about what you see of the problem that uh, Peter Weisberg has just described. My office is uh, responsible for um, monitoring all allegations of force, um, all allegations of excessive force, all allegations of misconduct that um, occur in the county jails, as well as the other functions of the Sheriff's Department, patrol functions, court services, et cetera, and other specialized units. Um, since we're focusing this afternoon on the jails, I will focus um, on what we do in the jails. Um, primarily. And what we do is when there is an allegation of misconduct or when there is a force incident, um, the department uh, does conduct an investigation. Uh, the robustness or the, um, of the uh, investigation is dependent, um, or it has been in the past, dependent on the injury suffered by the inmate. Um, if it's a significant injury, uh, that triggers an internal affairs rollout and the uh, specialized internal affairs unit uh, travels to the jail and conducts an investigation. If it's a uh, less significant injury, uh, at least at the first cut, uh, the initial investigation is investigated by the unit. Um, one of the issues, of course, is, is if there is violence, and I do not dispute that there is violence, and if, in fact, there is excessive force, and I do not dispute that there are occasions of excessive force, you know, let, me, let me give you that a little bit of perspective. I've looked at probably, hmm, a hundred different law enforcement agencies in the course of my uh, years as a prosecutor of the, of, uh, for the Department of Justice and more recently uh, working with outside agencies in my current capacity. And of those hundred, uh, hundred law enforcement agencies, every single one of them has had issues of excessive force. So this is not unique to the jail in LA County. It is certainly there and it certainly needs to be detected and people <coughs> who use excessive force need to be held accountable. Uh, there are challenges to doing that, and the legal system and our Bill of Rights um, and civil service protections uh, to employees all present hurdles and challenges to really addressing the issue. The first issue, of course, is the issue of proof. And um, because jails are unique and they are closed environments, and because um, uh, because of their being closed environments, the deputies have quite a bit of control as to where, in fact, inmates are moved or located. Um, it does present, certainly, opportunities uh, for force um, that is going to be undetected, um, but it also presents uh, challenges with regard to taking apart that uh, force, pulling it apart, doing an investigation, and getting witnesses that can prove, by a preponderance of the evidence, or in the criminal arena, beyond a reasonable doubt, that in fact a crime was committed, that an assault was committed, and those are very difficult challenges. Now, has the department always um, done its best to meet those challenges? Absolutely not. There are times in which the level of investigation has been insufficiently robust, in which the um, investigation has been tainted by perceptions and if not reality of bias on behalf of the investigators, and that clearly doesn't help the problem. 
But even under the most ideal paradigm, when you are conducting an investigation, particularly in cases in which uh, the level of injury is uh, less significant, and you have witnesses uh, that do either do not exist or um, have issues of credibility on their own because the legal system says they do, we can get into that if you want, um, then you're going to have challenges to, 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 uh, to establishing, in fact, uh, whether, in fact, uh, the violence or the force that was used was outside of the policy of the Sheriff's Department or outside the, policy, outside the laws of the United States. And those are two different issues, but those issues need to be looked at, obviously, in every one of these cases. One of the things that um, we have advocated and, and one of the things that has happened most recently is what I call the tiebreaker. And that is uh, now, um, and it took way too long, but now uh, there is a push by the Sheriff's Department to install video cameras, surveillance cameras, in the jails. And uh, I think there are now a couple hundred cameras that are up and running. And now we have cases uh, that are coming through the pipeline in which we can see, hey, it's no longer just inmate X saying this and deputy Y saying this, but we've got it on camera. And I think that, uh, for purposes of evidence, for purposes of proof, is going to be a significant change that's going to sort of change the landscape. Can the sheriff's office do a better job? Yes. Should it do a better job? Yes. Are there certainly issues in the past? Yes. Do those issues continue? Yes. Is there a culture in which deputies sometimes abuse their authority? Absolutely. And the question is how best to address this. Um, for us, the challenge is, uh, both in my former days as a federal prosecutor and, and current and as a monitor, uh, are significant because of some of the issues that I've highlighted in my opening remarks. So I want to uh, turn now to uh, Lawrence Middleton. And there's the question I want to ask, and then there's a question I'm going to ask. The, uh, the question I'd like to ask is, so what's going on with the federal investigations? Uh, and the question I'm going to ask is, what can you tell us about, <laughs> about how the process of uh, a civil rights investigation goes? And perhaps you should also explain why there are a lot of things that you can't talk about. Certainly. Um, it seems like whenever I speak at an event like this, I have to start with some type of disclaimer. Um, everyone at this panel uh, comes uh, at this issue from a different perspective. I come at it from the perspective of a criminal prosecutor. And for that reason, there are a number of things that I can't talk about. And specifically, I can't talk about specific cases that, this, that the United States Attorney's Office might be looking at or might be investigating. And as you might imagine, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the things I don't want to do is to say anything that might prejudice an investigation. Uh, for example, something that might lead to a motion uh, based on prosecutorial misconduct that might cause any uh, successful indictment to be dismissed. Uh, there are also issues of fundamental fairness. Uh, not only do we want to protect the government's case, but there's also an issue of fundamental fairness to any targets or defendants. Uh, so one of the things we certainly don't want to do by talking about a, an ongoing investigation is to, for example, uh, uh, poison a potential jury pool. Uh, so for that reason, there are, we, we, we certainly can't talk about ongoing investigations. There are also policy reasons why we can't do such a thing, including the fact that DOJ uh, has certain uh, restrictions on what a prosecutor can say about an ongoing investigation. So there are any number of reasons um, why we cannot talk about a, an ongoing criminal investigation. Having said that, though, I can say that certainly uh, we do investigations that, uh, that uh, address the kinds of issues that we're talking about here today. Uh, and I guess the first thing I'd like to talk about is the kinds of obstacles uh, that you face in doing an investigation uh, from a federal perspective. Uh, First of all, in looking at something like the Los Angeles County jail system, the first problem that you have to deal with is just the, the scope of the problem, uh, or at least the, an alleged problem. I mean, when you're looking at the Los Angeles County jail system, it's, it, it's one of the largest in the country, and so you have to deal with that, and just the number of allegations that might arise, the number of witnesses that you have to deal with, the number of documents that you have to re review. And just taking on an investigation like that just takes a long time, which obviously for the public uh, is not a good thing because the public wants to see action taken. But the first thing you have to deal with is that you have 
just such a large investigation. Another obstacle that we have to deal with as federal prosecutors uh, in investigating these kinds of cases is the fact that often we have dual investigations. Uh, there may be a, a, a state investigation. We also have to deal with the fact that often there are internal investigations uh, within, the, within the law enforcement agency. And the problem that that creates is that um, often there are interviews of potential witnesses, interviews of potential targets. Those kinds of things will just naturally slow down an investigation. And the reason that is the case is because if, for example, someone is interviewed who later becomes a federal target of the investigation, then we have to be, make certain that they haven't made a statement that was involuntary. For example, if, say, an internal affairs uh, investigator interviews a potential target and that individual talks, and he talks because he's given a choice between uh, either being fired or uh, incriminating himself, then that statement becomes involuntary. Now, once that statement is made, we as federal prosecutors cannot use that statement in any way. And not only can we not use it, we can't use it directly or indirectly, and we have to make sure that we are not exposed to that statement. Now, the problem that that creates is that in addition to doing an investigation of the underlying alleged crimes, at the same time, we have to set up a totally different set of prosecutors and investigators to make sure that every document that we look at, every statement that we review, has been previously reviewed to make sure that it's not involuntary. So those kinds of things just naturally slow down an investigation. Uh, other impediments to this type of investigation, as you might imagine, is just the kinds of witnesses that we have to deal with. And just the nature of the evidence, uh, you have to be very certain of your evidence to, to bring this kind of case because naturally, in many instances you're looking at, and Mr. Eliasberg talked about some of the witnesses that he's encountered uh, that are different for, from what I'm about to talk about. But typically what you have is you have inmates versus law enforcement officers, and there's just a natural tendency uh, on the part of jurors to believe law enforcement over individuals who, first of all, are incarcerated to start with and often have a long criminal history. So you have to be able to overcome that situation because most of the time uh, it's very difficult to get law enforcement witnesses. And of course, one of the reasons it's very difficult to, to get law enforcement witnesses is because of uh, what we call the, uh, the uh, code of silence. Now, whether there is or is not a code of so silence is probably a subject of debate. Uh, certainly back in the early 90s when the Christopher Commission did its study, it determined that there is a code of silence and it's not just in, or at that time, <coughs> that was an investigation of LAPD. It's not something that just applies to LAPD though. In my experience, uh, it applies to law enforcement in general. And so you have to deal with that. So it's very difficult to find witnesses to address the issues uh, that you're investigating. Another thing, a, a final problem, is that, uh, well, often when you're dealing with dual prosecutions, one of the things that you will, especially when you're dealing with excessive force within a uh, corrections facility, one of the things you have to deal with is that the witnesses or what we would perceive as potential victims uh, when these incidents occur, one of the things that happens is that they are charged with crimes. Very often at the same time that they're alleging that they were abused, uh, they are charged with assault on the corrections officers. And sometimes those, uh, those uh, cases go forward. So what you might have is, for example, especially if you're dealing with something like the jail, where some of the inmates there may be looking at getting out in, in fairly short order and, <clears throat> and being set free. But when they are charged with these additional crimes, then that means that they are potentially going to be staying there for a lot longer. And sometimes what happens is that the proceeding can draw out, and at some point their, their case hasn't gone forward, they're pending, uh, and they want to get out. And very often what happens is that they will decide that they're better off pleading, taking some type of plea that will get them out with the time served so that they can be free as opposed to waiting, having a trial, even though they're saying that they are the victims. Of course, what that does to our case is that in addition to having someone who's an inmate who already has credibility problems, 
what you end up with is someone who's actually entered some type of plea to the very incident that you're investigating. So you can imagine uh, the difficulty that that creates to a federal prosecution. So again, uh, those are some of the obstacles that we face. Having said that though, there are very good reasons to do a federal investigation. Uh, and one of those uh, certainly is the resources that we can bring to bear. Uh, typically when we're doing an investigation, especially if we're doing an investigation uh, the size of an investigation that would uh, involve the Los Angeles County Jail, then we would do that in conjunction with the Department of Justice in Washington. So we would have not only resources that can be brought to bear by the United States Attorney's Office, but also resources from the Department of Justice in Washington. So you have dual resources. You also have the FBI involved as the lead investigator in most of the cases. And so we have all of the, app, the resources that are available to the FBI. Uh, I think the other benefit or advantage of a federal investigation is that uh, certainly witnesses or potential witnesses view the United States Attorney's Office and the FBI as more independent than uh, perhaps a, an internal affairs investigator or sometimes even local investigators and even sometimes the DA's office. So that's an advantage. It's certainly something that we try to uh, try to foster, and not only try to foster, but we try to ensure that it's a reality and not just a perception. Uh, because very often, witnesses are very reluctant to come forward, uh, even anonymously. Uh, but one advantage that we have, I think, is that they are more inclined uh, to come forward uh, when they know that there's a federal investigation. Uh, I guess the final thing I would, I would say is that when we're doing these investigations as a federal investigation, obviously we have the benefit of the, uh, of the federal grand jury. Uh, and so, at least to some extent, uh, individuals who are involved as witnesses uh, feel like they can, they can come forward and there's a certain level of secrecy that's involved. And typically when we're doing these cases, that is the way we, we would proceed. We would proceed with a federal grand jury and uh, typically you issue any number of subpoenas both for documents and witnesses and you just present that case before the grand jury. Thank you very much. So Judge Baird, we're going to move from all of these lawyers and their different cases to a civilian commission, uh, which you are chairing. Perhaps you could explain to us first what the basic charge for the, um, for the commission is and what are your expectations for what you're going to be able to do with it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I hope I'm not going over what everyone already knows, uh, but as a result of <clears throat> what you heard and what you've read in the newspapers and whatnot. Uh, let's back up. The Board of Supervisors, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, has the <clears throat> obligation and the authority uh, to oversee uh, the central jails and, the, and all of the jails in Los Angeles County. Now, there has been some reference, I believe, by Mike here, uh, that the jails in Los Angeles County, the jail system, is not only one of the largest, it is the largest system in the, Uni in the United States. And it could very well be the largest system in the world as we know it. Uh, they have a huge amount of, of inmates in there. It's roughly, as I recall, about uh, what in the whole system, and how about how many are there, Merrick? I think there are about 16,000 at the moment. Okay. And, and rising. And rising. Well, okay. So you have to really stop and think about how big this is. 16,000 individuals are incarcerated uh, under the supervision of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. So it's, it's really a huge, huge operation. It also, I found it interesting that it is it has more individual persons with mental health issues and their mental health clinics. Uh, the Twin Towers is almost predominantly uh, limited to inmates with mental health problems. So it is a medical situation. It's, they have mental health, they also have a huge hospital. Uh, the LA County Board of Supervisors, especially recently since all of these allegations had been coming forth, and I think it was uh, just about the time that uh, uh, Peter's, the ACLU's case came, but it certainly wasn't a secret until before then, uh, decided they had to do something because it's up to them to do that. 
So they decided to put together this commission. And the commission, our mandate, there were five of us originally appointed, one from every, by every supervisor, one of the five supervisors, and then the five of us then elected two others. Uh, I'm not going to go into the bios by any means of all seven of them, or you'll all be asleep in about 10 minutes, but in any event, just to give you some classifications, there are four uh, formal, former judges, uh, three former federal judges, uh, and when I say this, you're going to probably count more than that, but many of us have separate little categories we fall into. But there are some federal judges and um, uh, a retired uh, California Supreme Court justice. Um, we have also with us uh, Chief uh, Jim McCon Mc McConnell, who is the Chief of Police of the Long Beach Police Department and was very high up in the Los Angeles Police Department until recently when he did move to uh, the, the uh, Long Beach uh, uh, situs. Uh, we have Alex Bazansky. Now, Alex Bazansky is uh, you have something from the Vera Institute, I believe, in your papers. Alex Buzanski was the head of the Vera Institute. It was immediately before that, uh, that paper was written. Uh, but Alex has a, a, a real sense of jails. Uh, as one of my colleagues said, we need to get someone who knows about jails. A good portion of us have been putting people into jails, but we have no idea what's going on in there or how to run them. So Alex is sort of our, our jail person. Uh, we also have Reverend Murray, and some of you may be familiar with him. He headed up the AME Church in um, South Central LA, and he is also associated with the University of Southern California. Now that I've given you sort of an overview of what, what, uh, who, could, who is there, uh, there, the mandate we had, and I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, uh, that we were given by the Board of Supervisors. As, as the mandate. The mandate of the commission will be to con conduct a review of the nature, depth, and cause of the problem of inappropriate uh, deputy use of force in the jails and to recommend corrective actions as necessary. So what we have done, the first thing we did once all the seven of us were assembled is we selected a, uh, an executive director who is actually managing all of the details. And we also were fortunate enough to have uh, our general counsel, who I think is in the very back row. He tends to take a, a back seat to things, and he's really the one who's running the show. And that's Richard Druyan. I believe Lori had uh, introduced him at lunchtime. Richard, Rick, come on, get up and stand up. Stand up, Rick. Uh, he has had a substantial um, uh, uh, connections with reviewing uh, things of this nature. He was involved in, I believe, the Christopher Commission, and he was also involved in many of the other ones, and I think chaired, which one was it, the Rampart investigation? Chaired that, was general counsel for the, uh, for the Rampart investigation. I believe we have nine um, deputy general counsels, most of whom are partners in private law firms here in Los Angeles. And each of them has devoted their time, as well as many of uh, the lawyers in their, uh, in their firm, to work with us. So the question then might be, well, what are you, what are you gonna do? <laughs> well, here is what we are going to do. I'll give you a little idea of what we've done. Um, we have a timeline, so to speak. It took us a while to really get organized. And fortunately, because there's a lot of bureaucratic things we had to go through to be able to get uh, confidentiality agreements and, and whatnot for the private lawyers to come in and do the investigations. And through the county council, which is the, the uh, attorney for the county as well as the sheriff's department as well. Uh, but in any event, we did finally get through that and that was probably not until maybe about February, I believe it was, late February, that we really were able to put people on board and get them out there to get things done. And so what we've done is, and, and when I say we've done, I, I, I'm taking credit, and really it's been the credit of, of Rick and his group. Um, the, we have distributed, started the investigation session, and I'm looking at a timeline right here. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, there is a website 
that you can log on to. And it gives you some information. The things that I've just brought with me are some of those things that, uh, that, I've, that, that are on that site. Uh, the website, if you can look up Citizens Commission on Jail Violence on Google. But it's really simple. It's lacounty.ccjv. And it has the minutes. It has videos of the, of the open sessions. All of the meetings are open and public. Uh, so there is some information there. We will be getting more and more information available. Uh, but in any case, and that was, uh, I credit our, our executive director who, who really put that together. Um, we are right now in what you might call the investigative phase. And what that consists of is that we have gone out and requested documents and information. It's almost like running a, 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 a lawsuit. Uh, we send out document requests. We send out interrogatories. Uh, we analyze the uh, key do documents that we get and the information that we get. And then we have interviews with key individuals that are involved. Um, we also then, of course, initiated public hearings. We've only had two hearings so far. Uh, last week, or this, I get so confused, I think it was this week that we had our, la our last meeting and our meeting that we had in March. In March, we had the benefit of bringing to uh, the meeting and, uh, present and, and presenting both Mike Janako and Merrick Bob, which was very, very helpful. And I'm, uh, you will be able to, they have just a fount of information. And so we took that evidence. These are all public meetings that the public can come in and even um, make comments about. We do have a, a, um, a public comment section where some people will come up and sometimes with some rather good points that they'll make. And um, then from, from uh, that point, we all, the next, next one we had was we had actual eyewitnesses. We had three witnesses from the ACLU. Uh, a former ACLU monitor, uh, a pres the present one of the present, I believe she is in Men's Central Jail, uh, the present a a ACLU monitor. Um, Margaret Winter, is that it? Margaret Winter, mm -hmm. she is the head of the National Pr Prison Project and talked with us about all of the cases that she had and her, her thoughts and opinions on this. And we also had three individuals uh, from the clergy in the men's central jail. Now, I'm not gonna give you all, all, all that you need to know, perhaps, to understand this, but there is the men's central jail, which was designed in the 1950s, was built in the 1960s. So needless to say, it just is very inadequate. There is what we call, is called the new men's central jail. Uh, that was built in the 1970s. And then we have the Twin Towers, that I believe were built in the 90s. Uh, the, um, the points that um, uh, I, I think are important to bear in mind is really the concept and the size uh, of what we have. The, the testimony that we received from the eyewitnesses uh, was quite compelling. Uh, and we did have some direct testimony about witnesses who actually saw some of the events. So what we are going to continue to do, at least our timeline as it stands right now, is that we will continue the investigations. We still have, I'm quite sure, witnesses that are going to be testifying uh, on, uh, in, in our, to our commission, uh, members of the uh, LA Sheriff's Department, uh, as well as other members as well. And then we will then go into the phase of gathering this information, drafting of documents, and then the commission will confer and make recommendations. We will most likely make findings and recommendations to the commission. So I don't want to take any more time because I know our time is getting late, but in any event, um, um, I, w I, I, w I suggest that you do go online if you have some questions. Thank you, Judge Perry. And so, Merrick Bob, I want to ask you a historical question. Because basically, you've been at this for some time, and you've, you've seen from uh, a variety of perspectives uh, what goes on in the jails and, and with the sheriff's office. Uh, is there, how much is new in what's going on here? Uh, how much of this is 
really problems that we've had for a very long period of time. Can you give us some context to this current controversy? Uh, these are problems that have existed for a long period of time. A number, of, a number of them were identified some 20 years ago when the Colts investigation <coughs> took place. Uh, others are, are, are more recent, uh, including something that's a little bit different, and that is that there are corruption allegations in connection with this jail, a uh, series of jail incidents that I have not heard of before, uh, where uh, a deputy was paid to bring a uh, cell phone into the jail, other, another was uh, paid to bring a heroin-laced burrito <laughs> into the jail. Uh, that kind of uh, misconduct is not something that we've seen much of, but they started to see now. Uh, what, what I think is, is new is that there is finally a concerted focus on the problem of the jails. There's the commission which Judge Baird uh, chairs. There's the work that Lawrence Middleton is doing in terms of a federal investigation. There's the litigation that has been brought by the ACLU, which probably more than anything has caused uh, cause to focus on, on, on some of these problems. There's the work of the media. Uh, there's the Los Angeles Times, there's Witness LA, there are a number of places that have looked deeply and thoroughly into the problems of the jails and have highlighted them uh, for the benefit of the general public. My job and what I do is to try to figure out what are the structural impediments to uh, a constitutional jail. And what are, the, what are the procedures, what are the policies that are in place that seem to encourage or at least not sufficiently discourage the use of excessive force? Uh, let me see if I can very quickly paint a picture of the LA County Jail, particularly Men's Central Jail. The LA County Jail, as Judge Beard said, is the largest urban jail in the United States, if not the world. The next two largest are New York City's Rikers Island and then Cook <coughs> County in Chicago. Uh, we here in Los Angeles have more inmates on a daily basis than either of those two institutions. Also, over time, uh, the people who occupy the jail has changed significantly, whereas 20 or 25 years ago, you would find that some 70% of the people in the jail were misdemeanants, uh, serving very short sentences. The average daily inmate population fluctuated quite a bit. People were in and out fairly quickly. Now, uh, as our DA could attest, the uh, population of the jail is much different. Uh, it is uh, s almost 90%, if I'm not mistaken, uh, people awaiting trial. Uh, there are many more uh, violent people in the jail. Uh, because of three strikes, uh, there is less plea bargaining going on, uh, and therefore people are, are, are staying in the jail and going to trial. There are uh, impediments to people being released uh, pre-trial uh, if, they, if they can't make bail. Uh, there is an older, sicker, uh, and more problematic population. Uh, that means that the LA County Jail, which was really built to house these misdemeanors on short sentences, is structurally not the kind of place you want to have, where you have uh, uh, as many pretrial people as you do now, including, as I have said, a lot of uh, people uh, accused of quite violent crime. In addition, uh, as we know, we are going to be in Los Angeles County getting a lot of people back from state prisons uh, in the next year or two. The population in the LA County Jail is going to go from roughly 16,000 uh, today to about 21,000 after those people come. And then 
it will crest and hopefully uh, settle back down a bit. But in the short run, we're going to see more people in our jails than we have been used to seeing for a while. Uh, Peter talked about uh, force, in, force in the jails and talked about how a lot of the force that he alleges and, and his witnesses have observed are uh, beatings that involve very serious damage to the head, uh, either from uh, the head striking uh, the floor or being stricken uh, by an impact weapon or the like. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing is looking at alternatives. Interestingly, Rikers Island in Cook County does not permit impact weapons in the jail at all. They are able to manage their jail without batons, without clubs, without flashlights that are really being used as <coughs> impact weapons. There's been progress in that regard. Uh, finally, after many, many years, our recommendation that the long, heavy metal flashlights, which have been used as impact weapons, are now banned in the jail. They will no longer be there. Uh, in its stead uh, is a flashlight uh, that is coated with a composite material and rubber. It's much lighter. Uh, it should prove to uh, give rise to fewer injuries. So we will see whether that is one measure that will help cure some of the problems that, uh, that Peter has described. Uh, we, we, we look at the jail and, as Judge Baird has said, uh, it's really a 1950s kind of a jail. So they're long cell blocks. It looks sort of like your vision of Alcatraz, just long cell rows. It's very difficult to manage. Uh, unlike Twin Towers, where there's a central control area and you can see all the cells uh, from a central point and control them from a central point. You can't do that in men's center. <coughs> so in order to get the kind of uh, uh, security that is provided by having uh, deputies in the jail uh, be able to observe all the inmates at any one time, it's probably a necessity to close down uh, Men's Central Jail, at least the old part. There's been progress there. Uh, the sheriff, although he's not given a specific time limit, has said that uh, uh, he's going to close down the old section of the jail and move people to Twin Towers and other facilities. That, if it happens, again, will be an element, a structural element that will reduce the likelihood of the kinds of uh, incidents alleged by the ACLU. Uh, the commission, uh, the jail commission, is uh, another very positive step forward, uh, mm -hmm. as Judge Baird described and as Rick Julian is, uh, is, is currently working on. We will have a series of recommendations from outstanding experts on other things to do to help fix the jails. One of the problems that I've identified and worked on for a long period of time is that the jails are staffed by deputy sheriffs. These are young people <coughs> right out of the sheriff's academy whose first experience in law enforcement is working in a jail. Many of them do not want to be there. They join the sheriff's department because they want to be police officers and they want to be out on the street. Nonetheless, it's the case that deputies serve five years or more in the jail before they get out to the street to become police officers. Some uh, really find that to be uh, a, a morale uh, er eroder. It erodes morale tremendously. They don't want to be there. They're unhappy about being there. They have no stake in it because they know they're going to be get, getting out of there sometime soon. Sometime, I mean, five years is not soon. Uh, and so they don't have the incentive, the stake, the, 
the, the willingness really to uh, look at the assignment, take it seriously. They may get uh, angry, they may act out their anger. <clears throat> so the question is, do you really need this five years uh, rotation in the jails before you get to be a police officer? Or uh, could you choose at the beginning of your career whether you're going to be a street police officer or whether you're going to be a corrections officer and have two different tracks so that those who decide affirmatively to go into the custody setting have an investment in it, have a desire that that be a profession in and of itself, a career in and of itself, uh, and that should eliminate some of the bad morale, that long waiting period that I described and the like. Uh, it's current practice within the Sheriff's Department that in each promotion level, uh, you go back to the jail. Mm -hmm. So if you're a street police officer and you want to promote to sergeant, you don't just promote to sergeant and continue being a police officer, you go back in the jail. So the supervisors, the sergeants, are in the main the youngest and the most inexperienced sergeants in the department. Uh, then, when you promote to lieutenant, the same thing. If you've been out on patrol, you go back in the jail, you're the youngest lieutenant in the, in the system. Uh, and you've had, you know, the, the deputies who were there for three or four years have more experience that, than you do in what goes on in the jail. They don't know. So, there's a very big problem with supervision within the jails. The sergeants and lieutenants are too few and too inexperienced, they also are looking to get their ticket punched so they can go out to, again, to patrol. Uh, so they don't have the serious investment in running a constitutional jail and a good jail. Uh, the captains, similarly, uh, are looking to have a patrol station. They don't have a serious investment. Commanders and other very senior executives also are people who uh, are not devoted 100% of the time and career-wise to corrections, to the best practices in corrections, and to uh, having a career in corrections. Uh, so I think we have to look at that, look at that uh, career track. I think we also have to look at the fact that in a number of instances, it's not a law enforcement uh, official per se who is uh, the head of the jail operations. In New York, uh, the head of the, Deputy of Corre De the Department of Corrections is a mayoral appointment, uh, and she serves at the pleasure of the mayor and has frequent contact with the mayor. Uh, the, I, don't, I don't think that we necessarily need to go so far as to create a Department of Corrections and take that and put it up, pull it out of the Sheriff's Department and have it in an independent department, even if it's possible to do that legally, which I think is uh, very much in question. But I'm wondering if we can't professionalize the correction side of the operation by having a professional corrections uh, a person with deep experience and a career in corrections to head up that side of the operations at the under sheriff or assistant sheriff level and be able to preside over a transition to a, a, a more constitutional jail. The other thing that we have to emphasize and is, is the, the crux of the problem in law enforcement in my view and that is accountability. And that is that the sergeant has to be responsible and accountable for the performance of the deputies under his or her control. The lieutenant has to be responsible for the performance of the sergeants under his or her control and all the way up the chain of command. And they have to answer for and be responsible for the, con the conduct of those they supervise. So they have to, it's a win of, serious force incident is occurring, they got to get out of their office and go down to the scene of the, uh, scene of the incident, uh, either help manage the incident 
or observe it or whatever, and then take whatever disciplinary steps are required to uh, correct any misbehavior or misconduct that occurs. As Lawrence Middleton has described, it's really tough to prosecute, uh, Steve Cooley can tell you the same thing, to prosecute a police officer. Juries don't want to convict, uh, and, so, and you have all these procedural impediments, uh, some would call them constitutional rights, but they also can be, they also can be uh, real impediments towards a, towards a prosecution. What you can do, and you don't have to do it beyond a, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, is you can uh, uh, discipline these people administratively. And there all you need is a preponderance of the evidence. And so one of the things that Mike Janako does and does so well is to look at the various investigations and to see whether, there, whether if discipline is meted out, it will stand up through the civil service process. So as I say, there's a lot going on right now. The problem that Peter uh, describes is stark. It's, it's very, very sombering uh, and sobering. It's somber and sobering. Uh, and uh, uh, yet, uh, I do believe that there are things in motion that should help to ameliorate, ameliorate the problem that are going on. The sheriff has appointed his own task force of commanders, uh, and things, things are starting to shape up a bit in the jails, I'm pleased to say. So uh, it, you know, it's not going to be over with tomorrow or next year or the next couple of years, but we'll get the report from uh, Lourdes Baird and her group, and my guess is that we'll be able to make some significant progress. Thank you, Merrick Bob. So uh, we're, we're sort of running out of time. I've got a million other questions I wanted to ask, but uh, I want to open it up to the, to the group and see, what, see if we can at least get some brief court back and forth. Is it true that sometimes deputies are taken off of patrol when they are facing some type of alleged misconduct and then placed in the jail pending the outcome of the investigation? Mm -hmm. Uh, there, uh, that has been alleged. Let me uh, ask Mike to respond to that. It has happened before. Um, the idea being that particularly people that have had integrity issues, um, Brady issues, um, or other misconduct issues that might find a better home in custody, we resist that. The sheriff is no longer tolerating or allowing that. Uh, because those same Brady issues do exist in the jail, you're still going to be witnesses to inmate assaults or deputy assaults or all kinds of other crimes that occur in the jail. So that's, by and large, been done away with. The only time in which um, that assignment would occur these days is when someone's not doing a very good job tactically in the field uh, in a patrol assignment, gets involved in some questionable shootings, for example, and in that case, it might actually make sense to put that person in a custody assignment. and the, the commission has been formed at the request of the LA supervisor. So how much teeth is there in, in the report? I'll just answer one sentence, one sentence with one word. We're looking at September to issue the recommendation. And I'm gonna to defer to the two experts, either one on this side or my side, to answer you. your question. It's, it's a problem. The sheriff is an independently elected official. Uh, he doesn't report to anybody except maybe in some theoretical sense of the Attorney General. He reports to and is responsible to the voters of Los Angeles County. Therefore, the Board of Supervisors can't give him a direct order to do anything. Uh, it can approve his funds. It approves the budget. It can't really line item the budget, but it approves the budget and extraordinary expenditures uh, by the department do have to come before the Board of Supervisors for approval. They also have the ability to settle litigation. And in the excessive force area and other areas, 
The Board of Supervisors has been uh, requesting and getting <coughs> corrective action uh, from the department uh, in connection with substantial settlements. The idea being that you know, if, they, if they're costing the, the, the county so much money, how can they avoid doing that in the future? And I think that uh, you know, that's, a, that's a real power that the supervisors have. But you know, in terms of recommendations that I might make, or that Mike Chinaco might make, or the jail commission might make, they're that. They're recommendations to the sheriff. And even if the Board of Supervisors say, all these ideas are wonderful ideas, they're not self-executing. I'd like to ask Mr. Weisberg, what is your evaluation of the effectiveness of the uh, consent decree imposed on the Rutherford decision? Well, the consent decree, I mean, since I've been focusing on violence, consent decree has nothing to do with violence. It's about crowding in the jails. Um, it has, it's, so we filed a new lawsuit because we attempted, but the sheriff vigorously resisted the idea. We tried to get discovery on violence issues in Rutherford and the, and the sheriff's refused, the council refused to provide it. I do think that there are, there are questions about, I mean, one of the things that we've tried to do through Rutherford over the years and pushed very hard three years ago was to get Dr. Austin to do his report, but the sheriff's department refused to provide the data. So there are limits to what you can do through a consent decree. We've also asked for discovery in Rutherford on other issues. The judge has never ruled on the motion. So there have been real impediments to trying to get what we think needs to be done in the jails through a consent decree. You need to have, arguably, you have to have cooperation from the defendants, and you also have to have a judge who's willing to issue orders. But Judge Pregerson has refused to issue orders. We have a two-year-old motion to uh, compel discovery on certain issues that relate to the jails. He's never ruled on it. So I have concerns that it hasn't been as effective as it should be. But one of the things it has allowed is it has allowed Esther Lamb and Mary Tiedemann to go in and be actual witnesses and interview the kind, so we, we have become aware of the level of violence in the jails through the access through Rutherford. So that has been a very valuable thing. But there are other areas we're very frustrated with what we've been able to do through the consent decree. How long has the ACLU been uh, the court appointed monitor in jails? Well, I think we have, we, all we have is access to the jails. Most monitors would actually be allowed to get documents. We're not, we don't get that. That's why we tried to reopen discovery. So court appointed monitors usually get access to information. The Sheriff's Department regularly refuses to provide us information. We don't get force statistics. We don't get to see the, the, the review of the, uh, the force packets. So we are access to, we are court appointed to have access to the jails. We unfortunately don't have the ability to get the kind of documentation that many monitors would get. And so I think that there are real limitations on our ability to effectuate the changes that we would like to effectuate through the system. Despite the limited role, how long has ECAU been formed that limited role? In 1985, we were allowed to make jail fronts, and we were allowed, we were given access to walk the rows in the jails. So that power that the ordinary attorney doesn't have um, is a power that, that we've been given through the court since 1985. I want to give our host My last question is actually for you, Professor, which is you're in and out of the jails on a regular basis, meeting with the inmates, talking to them, talking about their spiritual needs. Do you have a sense of what the morale is like, what, whether they, how reforms could affect what we're trying to accomplish in these jails? Do you have a perspective on that? Uh, thank you for the question, Lori. Um, it's, it's a tough one because I'm, I'm going in Twin Towers, I don't go to an MCJ, uh, and uh, I, you just, I just come in you know, for a brief period of time, uh, a couple times a month usually, uh, so I don't see that much. Uh, it's just you pick up little bits and pieces of things. Uh, so the first time I was going in, I was going to 271, which at the time was a pretty high security place. And one of the things that impressed me about it was, there, it, was it was sort of haphazard <coughs> as to how things were run. Uh, sometimes they'd let us have the class in the recreation room, which was way out from any place else. And supposedly these were high security uh, inmates. And I was okay with it, but it didn't feel like that was the right thing to do. Uh, and uh, now I'm in with the trustees, and it's a totally different atmosphere. Uh, but again, there doesn't seem to be a lot of continuity in terms of the staff. Uh, there's very little interaction between myself and the, and the deputies or the corrections assistants in terms of what's going on, just sort of the minimum that occurs. And then the one thing that always strikes me is uh, on the door to the control booth in 272, it has combative on it. Uh, so that's, I think, a sticker that they put on cells uh, for when they have an inmate who is combative, but that's what they're labeling themselves. 
Or at least that's the way I read it. Uh, and it's been there for years. Uh, and so there is, there is clearly uh, a cultural problem uh, of, of many dimensions here. And I think actually Merrick Bob had done, did a very good job of sort of illustrating how structurally there are real impediments to getting that right, uh, to getting people to really take charge and take seriously the work of the jail, which is very, very important work. Uh, and it does seem to be done more on a reactive and somewhat haphazard basis. So I want to thank this panel so much.